Um, when Roger does his, his podcast, um, he does relatively little um, preparation in anticipation of um, his interviews, um, much like Tommy Tiernan, who he's going to be interviewing um, uh, tomorrow. Um, I'd like to kind of keep it nice and relaxed and pretend that I haven't done any preparation for this <laughs> talk. <laughs> I'm not quite the skilled improviser um, that uh, Roger is. But um, the, the thing that fascinates me about you, Roger, is the way in which you look at, look at uh, medicine and how you have managed to somehow reframe it as a, a, a sort of a, a performance science. And I just, I, I think most people who are doctors in the room would consider <clears throat> when, they, when they think about performance, they think about musicians and um, actors, um, and maybe not something um, that might be associated with, um, with uh, doctors, that it's somehow artificial or somehow pretending. Um, what, do you think, what do you think about that? Or how yeah, I, I, think, I, think it's a, um, I think it's a fascinating issue because people often think of performance as that, that word makes people think of something that's unnatural or assumed or it's not really you it's a it's a front that you're putting on mm. that conceals the real you but actually i think that's a misunderstanding because i i think to me performing is is how we do what we do mm. um and it's the way we connect with other people mm. and the more i think about it and the more i've had conversations with other kinds of performer mm. performers the more i've come to think of it as Whenever we have an encounter with another person or other people, we are, we are selecting aspects of our authentic self, but we're choosing which ones to put out there mm. and engage with other people who are doing the same to us. Okay. And so it's not as if we're doing something that isn't us, but it's not the whole of us. We're, we're making choices, aren't we? And we're doing that now. We're, we're choosing which bits of our own experience to put out, to have a conversation with one another that's also being listened to by other people too. But if we were in a consulting room, we would do it differently. If we were in the pub with our friends, we'd do it differently. Any, any situation, I think, is a form of performing, which is how we engage with our other people about who we are. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah. So it's sort of, it's kind of curated, but it's, it's authentic. It's curated and it's, and it's selected. It's, mm. it's not sort of uncontrolled. Um, okay. And it's, I think curated is exactly the right word because that has also that resonance of of a relationship of care, curation, doesn't it? Mm. That you're looking after the person you're with in some way. Mm. So, uh, your, your book, um, Expert, is about experts, and I suppose most, most, most of us in medicine, um, and the general public as well, sort of understand that uh, an expert qualification in medicine, as a surgeon, you might do your, do your training and do your FRCS and study your exams and so on. Um, and then you come out with a consultant job <coughs> at the end, and that's somehow how people are defined as experts. But we all kind of know instinctively, certainly in the healthcare profession, that you can do all those things and still not be as expert as some other people. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was just sort of interested in, in, in how, you, how, you, how you define being an expert, um, as opposed to just that sort of external validation yeah. and qualification. And, and that's really what I've been looking at, and, and I still haven't got a simple answer to that, because yeah. I think... I think you can, you can often recognize experts. You can certainly recognize people who are not experts and sometimes people who purport to be expert but aren't. Um, but actually nailing it down is really difficult. And that's really why, I, why I've written this book and why I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out what it means to become expert, um, perhaps more than, than to be expert, because I think it's very much a process of becoming. Mm -hmm. And it's a process where you can, where it's easier to, to work out where it, come, where it starts yeah. than where it finishes. And, okay. and when you talk to experts, most of the people I would consider to be really expert never feel they are, mm -hmm. and certainly never feel they've got as expert as they could become. And so in a way, it's a it's sort of pathway with, with no definite end, mm -hmm. um, but it is a pathway that I think you can break into stages. And you can look at what are, what are the transitions, what are the processes that people go through as they go along mm. <clears throat> towards becoming expert. And one thing you can say for sure is that it takes a very, very long time. And so if some, it's sometimes easier to say if somebody isn't expert. And if they say, 
they've been doing something for six months and they're an expert. I think yeah. you can be pretty sure that they're not. Mm. Um, corollary doesn't apply. You can be doing something for a very long time and still not become expert. And I think that gives a sense of how complex this all is. Yeah. And that's really why I, I wanted to, in this book, to try and simplify it without oversimplifying it. Give it a, give that process a structure. So, but in, like in doing so, you've looked at expertise across a number of different disciplines, and you mentioned that there were commonalities. <coughs> stages. What, what, what are those? Yeah. What are so, those stages? Well, in a, in a nutshell, I've I've used a framework in the book that people will be very familiar with. Of uh, you know, you start off knowing nothing about it. You spend a long time doing what other people tell you. Then you get to the stage where you can go out and do it on your own. And then finally, you get to the stage where you've accumulated enough wisdom and skill to pass it on to other people. And the, the most sort of recognizable model of that is the apprentice journeyman master model based on the medieval guilds in, mm -hmm. in Western cultures. And of course, we don't use those words in any gendered sense now, but they do give a sense of, of there being a name for that stage mm -hmm. when you're in somebody else's workshop and doing what you're told. A name, uh, the apprentice stage, of course, as a journeyman, you're journeying across, you're, you're going out, you've taken up your indentures, you go across your country or, or your profession and you practice what you've learned, practice in the sense of practicing professionally. And then the third stage, which, which in that terminology is the stage of becoming a master, is where you then have people who are learning from you and so on. And I think that has a pleasing simplicity, hmm. but it also is very misleading because it is a descriptive account looking at the process from the outside yes. rather than an explanatory account understanding, making sense of it from the inside. And so in this book, the only, the only truly inside account I have access to is my own experience, yes. which happens to be in, in, in medicine, as you said, first in surgery, then general practice, then other things. But to make sense of it, I wanted to look at it from different points of view. Yes. And I suppose a penny dropped with me about 12, 15 years ago when I first met the tailor you mentioned, mm. Joshua Byrne, who was uh, through a mutual friend, who's a bespoke tailor. And I didn't know what a bespoke tailor was, mm. but it sounded really interesting. So I, I went to his, to his workshop and, and found out a bit more. Okay. Do you uh, want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was really fascinating because I, I went there thinking, okay, a bespoke tailor, uh, I mean, normally you see a suit or a jacket or something, um, but a bespoke tailor is somebody who makes the one you want uh, in the color and the cloth you want uh, to fit you exactly. Mm. And that seems fairly straightforward. And in a sense, there is that. But when I spoke to Joshua, it turned out he's a very unusual one. And, and he started explaining what he does when somebody comes to him and wants a suit or jacket or something. And he said he doesn't start off by talking about suits or jackets. He starts off spending time with that person and trying to find out from them what it is that they want. What is the issue, really, that they want this suit or jacket to do? Mm. do they, is it, what is the main thing? Do they want it to make them feel powerful or, or elegant or casual or whatever, or comfortable? What, 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 what is the issue that the garment is, is trying to address? And then having, started, having established that, he then starts with a blank sheet of paper and designs something, comes up with a provisional design for a garment, mm. which then comes into view through a series of fittings. Mm. He sends his design away to other tailors who, who actually make the garment, very complicated set of layers. And, and by little and little, over weeks or months, it, it, takes, uh, it takes form and, and the, the customer tries it on from time to time and gradually gets a sense of what it will not only look like but feel like. Mm. So when he was saying that, it, that, that, that seemed to me to be pretty much like what I was doing as a doctor because, mm. you know, I'd, I'd meet someone, same with, with all of us really, I'd meet someone maybe never seen before the first task was to try and work out what the problem was, what their problem was, mm. and then come up with a sense of what possible ways forward might be, mm. and then try them out, see if they worked, keep them going if they didn't, change them perhaps. Mm. Uh, it might be prescribing drugs, it might be doing all kinds of things. Mm. 
And, and it seemed to me that there was a very strong parallel between his approach to his customers mm. and my approach to my patients. So I st started to think, well, actually, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Because mm. here's somebody completely outside medicine who seems to me to be nailing something central yes. in clinical practice. And so I started finding out more about how he got to where he was and what he did, and that led to, uh, to having conversations like that with a whole load of other people outside medicine completely, some of the, you know, the magicians and taxidermists and hairdressers and all, all sorts of people, to try and build up a picture of what these stages might look like without being over-focused mm. on my own world of medicine, because it seemed to me that that was just one part of the picture. Mm. So, so you, you mean any of us who might have been thinking about a bespoke tailor might have been thinking as a surgeon that you would be interested in, in cutting or suturing or things like that, but you came away with something more Well, I did think unexpected. that at first. I thought probably the point of connection would be needles and threads. Yep. You, you know, tailors, they cut things up, they sew them together. Looking back at my sort of surgical days, I, I cut things up and sewed them together. I mean, there was more to it than that, but that was the sort of point of connection that I thought we would find. And that was very interesting because... At one point, I, when I first met him, I asked Joshua to show me what he did, and he showed me what he did with, with sewing on a lapel or something. Mm. And I thought, oh, that's taking me back to my days in the operating theatre. I asked him to let me have a go, and I was completely unable to do it. Mm. Completely unable. I felt a complete idiot. I was all thinking, you know, I, I just couldn't handle the, the materials, really. And when I thought about it afterwards, I'd thought that I was good at sewing. But, and I think at the time I was good at sewing. But I, was, I wasn't good at sewing in a general sense. I was good at sewing with a huge support network where I was standing up under yep. a bright light, dressed up with people handing me things and taking them away and cur curved needles and particular kinds of thread, which did not translate into doing other things with other kinds of needle and other kinds of thread sure. in a different environment. And that made me think that you have to be very careful about the, the uh, connections that you make between things where there are obvious parallels, but there are also big differences. Yes. So you can't map these things on exactly. You can, you can draw from one area of expert practice yeah. and see where it does or doesn't match with another one, but they're not, they're not carbon copies. Yeah, but clear, clearly for somebody like Joshua to become bespoke tailor like that and to approach designing a suit for somebody in that way yeah you don't just do that on day one i mean you have to serve as you say an apprenticeship yeah. and and that apprenticeship has to start presumably with him learning to yeah, do and, the basics and, of his uh, trade and he was really interesting because he could he nailed exactly when that started he, he'd yeah. been at university studying agriculture and economics actually but halfway through his course he just happened to go to the cinema he said and he saw a, a film which had a scene with a tailor in it and for some reason he realized that actually that's what he wanted to do. So he left university and he became an apprentice jacket maker for five years. So what did he do for the five years? And what he did for the five mm. years, for a lot of the five years, he spent doing stuff that was really, really tedious and boring. And he spent, his, his the example he gives is making pocket flaps. There were loads of other examples, but yep. flaps in a jacket. And he would be there at a, at a workbench. And he said right from the beginning, he understood what he had to do but it was years before he was able to do it because it involved developing those skills of managing the cloth and the thread and the things like that to create something that was perfectly shaped and just right. Mm -hmm. And his, his master, he had an old-fashioned master, who'd come along and just sort of look down at what he was doing and said, mm -mm, no good, and sounds go away. <laughs> sounds familiar. <laughs> sounds familiar to you. Yeah, it sounds familiar to me. Um, and, and so, yeah, exactly. And I thought, yeah, no, that rings a bell. Um, and, and the master wouldn't, uh, but, but eventually, <coughs> after he kept going, <coughs> excuse me, kept going and kept going, he started to get the sense of when it was beginning to be right. Mm. But he only did that by doing stuff again and again and again for far longer than he wanted. Mm. It was very frustrating at the time. But interestingly enough, talking about it, when, when I met him, when he was a, a master tailor, he saw it very differently because he saw it as having all kinds of benefits that went far beyond being able to make pocket flaps, which of course is a useful thing, a necessary thing for tailors to be able to do. But it gave him partly 
an understanding of all the different kinds of cloth and threads and, and what they felt like, what they looked like, what they smelt like, gave him a sense of working with other people, gave him a sense of, of sort of being immersed in that world yes. of becoming a tailor. And that's what I've called doing time mm. in my book as, as one of those stages of that mm. apprenticeship thing. And I, I, I started to think about whether there were parallels in my own experience that, mm. that I could think of in that way, things that you know you have to do because someone tells you you don't particularly want to, but there they are. You wonder why somebody else couldn't do them, really. Mm. But actually, in retrospect, the view looks rather different. You do, you do write in the book about, uh, there's an inter interesting parallel between stitching on pockets and, and phlebotomy. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I'll, read I'll, I'll read you just a, a couple of pages because um, it made me think of, uh, it took me back to when I was a medical student, uh, which was in the 1970s, yeah, in, uh, okay, in Manchester. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and I've called this chapter Doing Time, and I, I wrote... It's a Sunday in Manchester Royal Infirmary in 1974, uh, and I've been sent to do the bloods. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I need to just have a glass of water. Um, I've been sent to do the bloods. So for the whole morning, I go from patient to patient taking blood for routine preoperative tests. Nobody else wants to do this job, which is why I've been given it. It's the first time I've been in hospital as a medical student and I'm feeling excited. Proudly wearing my new white coat, I've crammed my pockets with specimen tubes, syringes, needles, and a wad of request forms. A harassed houseman, as newly qualified doctors were called at that time, showed me once what to do, then vanished, leaving me to face the world <laughs> on my own. By now, I'm halfway through my time at medical school. For three years, I've been learning facts. I've spent hours in the dissecting room memorizing anatomy. I've spent hours in the histology lab, too, looking at slides under the microscope. I've learned about physiology, pharmacology, and pathology, but I've never touched a patient. My first two bloods are easy, patients with large, juicy veins, which are straightforward to puncture. My confidence blossoms, but not for long. Turns out I've had beginner's luck. Once reality kicks in, I discover that taking blood can be incredibly difficult. Some patients seem to have no veins at all, or thick, hard ones like clay pipe stems, or deceptive ones that look easy but burst into huge bruises at the touch of a needle, often I cause my patients pain as I try again and again. And although they're very understanding, I feel dreadful. Even managing the kit is a challenge. I need at least four hands to hold the syringes, needles, tourniquets, sticking plasters, and swabs. In spite of all the facts I've learned, when it comes to doing, I'm all thumbs. Just as bad as the triplicate forms, and the specimen tubes with tiny, shiny labels, which my baro won't write on properly. Remember those? <laughs> um, yet, unless I'm meticulous, the forms and tubes can get muddled up, and that could be disastrous. And quite apart from the physical skills of blood taking, I have to develop ways of keeping track, ensuring I can put my hands on things when I need them. Nobody told me about that part. I've had to create a system for myself. It's tough, but gradually I get the hang of it, and after a couple more Sundays, I... I start to feel a lot more confident. A couple of months later, that new confidence takes another hit. I've been sent to insert a cannula, put up a drip, as it's often called, in a patient who's been admitted on the emergency take. His blood pressure's low, the houseman is busy, and I've been told to set up an intravenous infusion. I've seen it done, and it looks straightforward enough. After, I've, after all, I've learned how to take blood now, so I should be able to put a cannula into a patient's vein. Then reality kicks in. Faced with a sick patient, a bag of sterile saline, and yards of plastic tubing, I have no idea what to do. I'm back to square one. But eventually I got the hang of the bloods. I worked out a system for keeping track of my specimen bottles, lab forms, syringes, and needles. I could put up drips and manage the kit. I was gaining confidence in approaching patients I'd never met, and I was coming to terms with causing unnecessary discomfort. I'd begun to join a community of practice. I was even able to help a junior student myself, giving them tips about how to do what I'd once found so difficult. And already those difficulties were starting to blur and fade. I couldn't put myself back in their position because I'd moved forward. I'd taken a step along the journey towards becoming expert. Mm. But I learned something else from doing the blood, something even more important, which I didn't notice at the time. While I was concentrating on getting around all those patients to take their blood before the lab closed, 
I wasn't only learning marksmanship with a syringe needle. I was learning to talk to people and to listen, to gain their trust and to get them to let me into their personal space. I was learning to steal myself so I could carry on, even when I was causing pain and I knew that someone else more experienced could have done it better. I was learning to relate to patients, to navigate the space between myself and another person, someone who's anxious, uncertain, and vulnerable. In a nutshell, I was learning to become a doctor. Mm. And I, I put that one in there because I think that, to me, what you think you're learning isn't necessarily what you are learning, or it's not all you're learning. Mm. And all the experts I've spoken to in many, many different um, areas of practice mm. say something rather similar, that you know they go through that really tedious, boring time, and it doesn't seem to be making headway. Why the hell are they doing it? But afterwards, mm. only much later, they recognize things mm. that were really important that they didn't notice at the time. Mm. Okay. So... Um, so clearly, I mean, you're describing there in musical terms, what would be, obviously you've got to learn theory um, and then you've got to learn the scales and the arpeggios and nobody yeah. likes learning scales or arpeggios. arpeggios but you have to do them. Um, but you have to do them. And then presumably at the, at the end of that process, throughout your medical training as an undergraduate, as a postgraduate, you're, you, through that apprenticeship, acquire technical knowledge, embodied mm. physical yeah. knowledge which helps you to do your job and so on. And then you arrive. Yes. And you think then you've you're, got then you're <laughs> And then you're it. Yeah. Um, um, and um, there's, a, to extend the musical analogy, there's a lovely quote in your book from um, C.P.E. Bach, who was Johann Sebastian, one of his many um, children. Um, and it, is, um, it, it relates to keyboards, keyboardists. He's written an essay on keyboardists. Keyboardists whose chief asset is mere technique are clearly at a disadvantage. They overwhelm our hearing without satisfying it and stun the mind without moving it. So that sounds a little bit familiar to me as a young consultant starting out. <laughs> um, but he speaks to the idea that, that technique, technique and knowledge isn't yeah. enough. I mean, it has to be there, doesn't it? But it's Up, not yeah. the whole story. And I think that that's, to me, that brings me back to the insights I got from Joshua Byrne, mm. who spent in his first apprenticeship the, all those years learning to do stuff, populating mm. his head with techniques and facts and things, and, and then went on to another apprenticeship, which was all about working with people, mm. which was, as he saw it at the time, the skills of making garments fit individuals perfectly. Mm. But then he moved on. And I think what he was talking about and what I recognized when we first met was the need to connect that sort of uh, clearly defined, laboriously populated world of facts and you know in my yeah. case anatomy and physiology and all that stuff and the things that you do but connect those with the uncertain unknown world of individual people mm. if you've not yet met but when you do you have to make sense of a, a way of thinking that is not what you've learned mm. and doesn't necessarily mesh with it mm. and so at the beginning I think I saw being a doctor being a student and being a doctor as learning a whole lot of stuff in pigeonholes and then finding, asking enough questions from someone to find out which thing to take out of which pigeonhole and stick onto that person mm -hmm. with a label. But then as I, as I uh, and, and so I was asking questions to which I already knew there was an answer. Mm -hmm. But as I, as I became more experienced, and particularly as I became a GP, I think I start, my starting point became being with the person who was there and saying, okay, what, what is the problem? What mm. is concerning you? Mm. And waiting to hear it from them mm. rather than telling them all the answers I had yes. and trying temptation. to stick one onto them, which is a, a temptation. And it's I think temptation. that process, yeah. which to me is the essence of the journeyman mm. stage, the, when you take up your indentures and you start to do stuff, with your own, under your own responsibility. I think that's that stage yes. that is a really interesting, n not, not nearly as much as written about that as about the early stages. And I think that's partly because it involves these internal transitions. Mm. Uh, one of the things you talk about in this, I mean, there's obviously the apprentice stage um, and then this um, journeyman transition phase, which probably is the equivalent of us being new, new consultants or working in primary care for the first time mm. on our own yeah. and so on. 
two important things that seem to take part in that stage. To my mind, you mentioned about developing a, a, a voice, a particular voice. Um, um, and I think one of, the, one of the things you point out in your book, I think, is, is that, you know, presumably we all um, go through similar-ish training, um, but at the end of the day, we're all different. We're all different. Yeah. We're all different doctors. And the doctors and musicians and performers who make a difference, I mean, you don't want to be in a cover band your whole life, um, are the ones that, if you like, absorb the influence and voices of their um, mentors, um, the experience they've had, yeah. the mistakes they've had, their personality, and somehow channel that yeah. into <clears throat> a sort of a, um, a, a, a unique voice through which they were able to communicate and express their humanity to patients. I so think that's right, and I think the system yeah. doesn't help because the system categorizes people by anonymous levels, doesn't it? You yeah. know, you're an ST4 in rheumatology or an SD7 in, or you're a consultant, whatever. Yeah. And that doesn't really allow for the fact that not all SD4s in rheumatology are the same. Of course not. Mm. And, and as you go, go through that gentleman stage, I think one of the things you need to sort of accept is that you are developing your uniqueness as a whatever it is that you are. You're not yeah. just an interchangeable cipher on a board, but you are you. And, and that's what patients recognize and respond to of course it is and that's a a necessary thing mm. but it has to be and and that i think is what the jazz musicians talk about when they talk about voice isn't it mm. which is why you can recognize somebody who has got a long way along that path you can you know it's a saxophonist or something you put on a, a record or a recording and you know immediately that it's it's one rather than another mm. not just an interchangeable cipher on the board and and that's what you want but but there are dangers in that because it, it, you can then feel that the whole thing is about you mm. rather than what you're there for. And what you're there for if you're a musician is playing music and the people who listen to it, what you're there for if you're a doctor is your patients, of course. Mm. And, and so I think that that need to, to develop and take ownership of your personality and, and what makes you a unique doctor needs to be tempered by another kind of recognition, which is something that came to me from working with close-up magicians, which is that the whole thing is not about you. Mm. Mm. And the magicians, several of them, one in particular, Richard McDougall, who, who sort of alerted to me uh, about alerted me about that, said he had to learn that it's not about you; it's about them, as the magician said. And by the them, they mean the audience. And, and I think that goes to what we were saying earlier about the, the difference between learning all these things and these skills, mm. and then what you do with them. Mm. What's the point? What's the point? Mm. And, and those two things can be in tension because in a way, you, you know, you go into the beginning of that journeyman phase, and certainly in my experience, you know, you pass difficult exams and you pass them, and you're really pleased with that, want to show off um, maybe a bit and, uh, or a lot. And, and it's easy to to sort of lose sight of, of what the whole thing's for, which is mm. your patients who really don't care about, the, they just really want to know whether you can help them with whatever is bothering them, mm. I think. Um, but at the same time, as I say, you are developing your individuality. So how do you keep those, how do yes. you keep those running along without one zooming ahead of the other or causing problems? So do you think, do you think I mean, clearly self-reflection, um, reflective practice and work is really important in that regard. Yeah. But do you think there are external ways, external ways of monitoring our performance? Because it's difficult to perform and to monitor your performance at the same yeah, time. Yeah, th well, I, mean, I think there are certainly, certainly ways of, 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 of to getting your eye in for recognizing what is going on beneath the surface in a consultation setting. Mm. And you can do that by sitting in, can't you, and watching other people consult. You can do that by inviting other people to sit in and watch you consult. You can do it through video. There are various ways. But we do, we do it. I mean, we do it throughout our training as junior doctors. But once yeah. you become, yeah. you know, a, a, a GP or you become a consultant, it's you on your own with that patient that, in the room. That, that's one of the problems, isn't it? I think of the system is that you, unless you, act, if, unless you take steps actively to invite other people in, mm. you can be in a bubble. But most people don't. But most people don't. Mm. But I think we could if mm. we chose to. And I, I know you, you told me once that you have. 
Yes, it's something, it's something I did. I, I mean, I was certainly fascinated by this an article in The New Yorker by Atul Gawande about, um, about coaching and how he reflected um, having had his tennis game transformed by, a, by a, a, a coach. He decided to bring an old boss and mentor of his in to watch him operating in theatre for a few days. And um, I think it fundamentally changed the way he practised. So I brought a, a colleague in of mine to watch me either be the most amazing rheumatologist <laughs> in the country or a complete charlatan. Um, and it was, it was hugely useful for me. But I just, when I talk to other people about it, nobody seems to have done it. And if you frame medicine as something where there is an element of performance, yeah, why, yeah. Why, why not? Because yeah. otherwise you run the risk of it being all about performance. And, you know, you, we all know the um, very charming, slick, older consultant who overcompensates for their declining levels of academic knowledge or medical knowledge. Um, and in general and practice, the patients, and, the patients yeah. and, the <laughs> and the patients love them. The patients yeah, love them exactly. Because uh, nobody knows. Because nobody and that's the point. <laughs> that nobody knows except you. And so, so there's, there's, there's great potential yeah. for self-deception or deliberate uh, deception and, and forgetting that yeah, balance yeah, okay. wrong. And I think that I'm not at all saying that, that, that performing is a substitute for those things. It's, a, it's a, another part of the same coin, yeah. I think. And, and, but one of the interesting things, I think, about thinking about your work as performing is you can then start to think about what is the balance between... How do you get the balance right yeah. between you and your patient? And one of the things I learned from the magicians I've worked with is mm. about the role of silence. And I thought maybe I could just... Mm. just and, and the role of silence, but also the... Um, the seductive, um, the seductive appeal of copying people in doing just one part of of a role when you think it's the whole. And so, um, I'm going to introduce you to Richard McDougall, who started learning magic at the age of six. When he was eight, he retired, as he put it. Um, but a couple of years later, he came out of retirement and he got back to it in earnest. And he began with the skills of physical manipulation, working with coins and cards and cups. And Richard calls that learning from the elbows down. When Richard was learning, it was all from books. But, but now there are videos online that allow you to copy an expert. And lots of beginners become very good at this. But however dexterous you are, moves are just moves unless there's an audience. There's no magic unless someone is watching. Because the experience of magic is jointly constituted, and that happens from the elbows up. And that's where Richard's real mastery lies. When Richard performs, he creates a space where he engages with his audience. He uses his personality and charm to direct the audience's attention where he wants it. And that establishes, in his case, of course, a place that's very close to where the audience is looking, but which they're unaware of. Yes. Uh, and that's, of course, where he, where he does things. As a magician, you have to understand how to move the spotlight of attention to recognize where your audience is looking and to make use of those spots of perceptual blindness as you perform a trick. And Richard also talks about the importance of silence. A lot of magicians think that if the audience are not clapping or laughing, they're not enjoying it, he told me. But that's not necessarily the case at all. That's a harsh lesson. Silence does feel awkward, but actually, People are thinking, they're evaluating, they're processing. Silence is massively useful, provided it's done with warmth and sensitivity. Because every trick, he said, needs time to land. Lots of magicians are in a hurry to do the next one. But that's a mistake. And I said, as a doctor, becoming comfortable with silence is equally important and equally difficult to learn. Silence is not just the absence of speech. It provides a space for a different kind of communication as the GP and psychotherapist John Lorna, who we'll be hearing from later in the conference, put it to me once. He said, two silences can also be a conversation. But we tend to leap in and talk instead of listening. We shy away from silence and we rush to fill the space. So when we listen instead of talking, our attention is, is where it should be, on those our work is for. Listening, then, is a hallmark of being expert. We can't be in broadcast mode all the time. When we're doing something for others, we need to be quiet, pay attention. The communicative aspects of our work, the ebb and flow between performer and audience, require transmission, reception, and silence. Mm. And that's framing audience and performer yeah. as clinician and 
participation. Okay? I think it's, it's a very interesting idea around what performing means that we can apply equally to medicine, mm -hmm. I think. There's, there's a lovely quote from uh, Miles Davis. Um, he says, I think, or he said, um, you don't have to play all the notes, just the pretty ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's picking out which are the yeah. pretty ones. Okay, so um, just to, 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 to move on, one of our, one of our previous speakers, uh, Mark Reed, who's known on Twitter as Medical Axioms, has written a beautiful book of, of medical aphorisms. And um, one of my favorite quotes of his is, is that the worst doctors will point out errors of their colleagues, the best will tell you about their own. <laughs> Thus, you can differentiate them. Um, <laughs> I, I, so I was sort of interested in on your take on, on the importance of, of, of mistakes and errors. I mean, because they happen to us all. In, they do, in, don't in, they? In, in medicine. Yeah. And um, how it is that you can, you can learn from them. Because I, one of the, the really great parallels you brought in the, in, in the book is you tell a story about um, being, a, being a novice pilot. Okay, sh should I tell you that story yeah. and then we can talk about error and yeah. how it fits in? Roger does everything. He plays the, he plays the harpsichord. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a pilot. Well, what was? And you'll hear more about that. <laughs> so, so yes, I, I was a pilot. I, 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 I was... This is the time when I was um, working at Barragonath Hospital in Soweto in the 1980s as a, as a surgeon, trauma surgeon. And there was a little tiny flying club opposite, and I'd always wanted to, uh, to, to, to have a go at flying, so I'd, I'd learned to fly a, a private aeroplane, and so I got my pilot's license. Uh, soon after I got my pilot's license, I took off in Kilo Sierra Lima, that was the little tiny aeroplane, one, one engine aeroplane, on a short hop to Rand Airport. Rand was one of the several large airports in Johannesburg, but I'd never been there before. My flying school was so small it didn't have a control tower, and I wanted to practice to somewhere larger. My instructor, Bill, told me, you can't miss Rand Airport, just turn left at the Silver Water Tower soon after takeoff, and you'll see the runway ahead of you. I took off, saw the Silver Water Tower, and turned left. At first I couldn't spot the airport, so I kept going for a bit longer, and eventually I saw a sizable runway. Although it was a, a little to one side of where I was expecting, I radioed Rand Airport Tower, got clearance, and landed. The runway seemed very long as I was taxiing along it, but it was only when I passed a row of jumbo jets and a sign saying, Welcome to Johannesburg <laughs> International Airport, that <laughs> I realized I'd landed unannounced at one of the continent's busiest airports instead of the one I was aiming for. Soon after that, my radio crackled into life with a furious voice barking, Kilo Sierra Lima, Kilo Sierra Lima, do you read me? I parked my little Cessna in front of the tower and then spent the next half hour in a most uncomfortable interview with the air traffic controller <laughs> and his team. By sheer luck, it had been a quiet afternoon with no passenger aircraft scheduled to take off or land, because if I'd come down in the path of an incoming airliner, I could have caused a catastrophic crash, killing myself and a plane load of others. The only reason I wasn't crucified was that the tower crew had relaxed their normal vigilance and they hadn't yet noticed me coming until I'd actually landed. <laughs> red, red faces all round. So although the primary fault was mine, the safety net that should have picked up my mistake early had failed too. So after a severe dressing down, I was allowed to get back into Gilo Sierra Lima, much chastened, and fly back to Baragwanath Airfield. As soon as I landed, I told Bill what I'd done. Bill wasn't known for his sensitivity and I braced myself for a tirade. But to my astonishment, he burst into laughter, took me into a private room, produced a bottle from somewhere, poured us both a glass, and then started to tell me about the time he wrote off a twin-engine plane by forgetting to put down the undercarriage. <laughs> more, more stories followed, and I, I realized that by making my mistake, I'd moved one step nearer the, the center of a community of practice. I'd joined the company of pilots who'd made errors they didn't normally talk about people who know that error is inevitable, but who only tell you about theirs when you've made one yourself, just like surgeons. Bill didn't minimize the seriousness of my mistake. It could have been horrendous, and it was sheer luck that I didn't cause a major disaster. But he realized that I needed to use that experience to become a better pilot, not let it make me lose my nerve, so I never flew again. And I don't know if anybody in the audience has had the experience of making a mistake. Um, and then talking to somebody about it, somebody who's been around longer and, and, and has taken them into a room, closed the door, got out a bottle and had a conversation of that kind. But it, it happened to me again and again 
mm. um, in my clinical career and talking to all the experts mm. that I've drawn together in the book and many others besides, they, they tell similar stories. So there's something about recognizing that error is inevitable, but managing it and developing mm. the resilience to deal with it. But you don't do that on your own. I think you need to do that with other people. And so the interesting thing about error is that although you know it's going to happen, mm. you don't know when. And so you may have mapped out this path of where you've got to in your own experience, but you never know when something like that is going to happen. Speaking of which, I'm not careful, we're going to run out of time. Run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, just to kind of fast forward then to the, so this third stage that you talk about after the apprenticeship and journey, yeah. the master, is how, how, do you, how do you know when you're, when you're a master? How do you know when you're a master? <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure the answer to that. I mean, finished. sometimes the system gives you signals that you think you should be because you're a consultant and you're taking on trainees or something like that. Mm. Um, and that's another story, isn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> there are all sorts of differences between how the world sees you and how you see yourself, I think. Um, but I think that, to me, a characteristic of being a master is that there is another of those shifts from it's not about you, it's about them. But this time the them is people who are yeah. following behind you, people for whom you have a responsibility. And my own experience, particularly with having harpsichord lessons, mm. is that a master sees things that you yourself yeah. don't notice. Mm. And so I've been having lessons with Sophie Yates for uh, 20, 25 years. And the things that I think are the problem are not the things that she thinks are the yeah. problem. She, the things that I think are the problem are to do with fingering and being able to play things without getting them wrong. And things that she sees are quite different. Things like, you know, how, how, am, I, how, am, I, how am I sitting? How am I, how am I thinking about this work? How am I, is this the right piece of repertoire? Is this the time perhaps to, to start playing in front of other people? Is this mm. time, you know, different things. She sees in a much wider mm. canvas all the stuff that I and, and the other people she's had mm. tie in with all the experiences she's gone through in going far further than I ever will yep. along that path. And I think she has that ability which masters have to look back and see mm. what aspects of somebody's career need support and in what way mm. support and challenge and kind of curate that for people early on in the stage. So but that's never, what I think never, it is. You're never finished though, really, Roger. Never right? finish. You're never obviously finish. not. I don't think any of us <laughs> <are>. <laughs> But we've got to finish now, haven't we? Because yeah, we've sure. got to move on. No, but I think it's a serious point because mm. Speaking to lots of, of, of these, as I say, 20 or 25 people in this book, I asked most of them that question, you know, yeah. where, how did you know when you got there? Mm. And they, all of them say the equivalent in Joshua's case of, uh, he says, I know, so, I know that there's no such thing as a mm. perfect suit, but I will never stop trying to make one. And they all have that sense that they may have got quite a long way, but there's a lot further to go mm. and that they're still on a path that's continuing. And I think that's one of the most fascinating things about people who are becoming experts. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, Atul Gawande has said that, that about just about curiosity, because I was just going to ask you one quick question mm. about that. He yeah. says, once, once we lose the desire to understand, to be surprised, um, to listen and to bear witness, we lose our humanity. Amongst the most important capacities that you take with you today is your curiosity. Curiosity. You must guard it, for curiosity is the beginning of empathy. You strike me as a fairly curious kind of a person. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, uh, given, given what healthcare education yeah. systems and the healthcare system in general does to knock the curiosity out of us, how do you how do you how do you think we can reinvigorate our curiosity? Well, I think I think sort of looking outside what we do. The, the, a big penny dropped with me after meeting Joshua, when I recognised that all all around in our sort of ecosystem of other people are loads and loads of people just as expert if you choose to see them. And so being curious about, about what are the lives of the people yeah. that, that we encounter every day, not only our patients, but the people we, we meet who, who, do in, you know, who do other things. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a way of thinking that allows you to spot um, interesting conversations, if you like, okay. that you might have and pursue them. You stay open, you stay surround open. yourself by, yeah. by interesting people. Yeah, and you, and you people. ask questions, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, um, Thank you so much, Roger. Thank it's you. been wonderful talking. We could go on for we hours, could, but, but I would can't. like to open it, open it up to open it up to 
the audience. By the way, just if you're in the audience, you'd like to ask a question, there's some roaming mics there which will be passed around. If you're online and you're not using Internet Explorer, <laughs> and you, can, you can post your questions online and we'll try and get to them. So, um, any questions from the audience? Somebody there. Thank you, Roger. That was fascinating. Um, my name's Ken Feely. We hear quite a bit in the learning process, or the journey phase, as you describe it, of the so-called 10,000-hour rule. And some people believe in it, and others say that it is not true. Do you have any sense in your discussion with experts who have traveled that journey of the truth or falsehood of the 10,000-hour rule? So the 10,000-hour rule, as, as, as you called it, is, comes from the work of <coughs> Kay Anders Ericsson, who did a, an awful lot of research for people who are not familiar with this for a long time. And, and worked with elite performers of various kinds and came up with this idea that, that, that all the people who were really elite performers had spent around about 10,000 hours or 10 years of what he calls sustained deliberate practice. And that became sort of popularized by other people, Malcolm Gladwell and various other people, and became a kind of a mantra. And I think that there is something interesting and useful about it in that if you look at people who are really expert, none of them have done it overnight. They've all spent a very long time, and 10 years sounds a reasonable kind of sort of figure to, to think about. But the, the, the problem is that the corollary doesn't, doesn't hold. So you can spend 10,000 hours very easily and not become very good at what you're trying to do. And, and there is a, a sort of mistaken view, I think, very often, that this work that came from relatively narrow laboratory and observational work with a smallish number of elite people applies to everybody. So I think the general principle that if you want to get really good at something, you need to work very hard for a very long time, is absolutely the case. But I think that, the, that the, it, it doesn't work in the other direction um, in, in, in a simpler way as that, that formulation may, might make you think. Mm -hmm. Ronan, what, does that make sense to you? The, about the 10,000 hours, you know, because... Well, it takes, I mean, it takes time. It takes yeah, a long, it does, it takes it? A long time. Mm. I mean, obviously, yeah. the learning of the technical skills, but then the development of voice and yeah. incorporating it into your personality. And, and the having all that stuff and then being able to improvise, yeah. being able to bring in the right bits of it when they're needed, mm. quickly, and, and respond in the moment. I think that's what the 10,000 hours gives you. Ha you know, having been through a lot of stuff, made a lot of mistakes, tried to put them right, gives you a whole lot of things that you can draw on very fast in each situation, which is, of course, different from any other. So any other? Oh, somebody over there, and then somebody there. We're both we're both shading our eyes, aren't we? Because we we can't really see into the light. Wave your arms about so we can see. <laughs> um, I'm very interested in the interaction between the expert then and the teacher, because once you've become an expert, you sometimes don't know why it is the learner can't grasp or understand where your expertise what your expertise has told you, and I'd like to know what you think about that. Yes, I, th I think that's one of, the, one of the reasons why teaching is so demanding and so exciting, is that you are then having to look back at something that to you has become very straightforward, something that you struggled with. Um, and I mean, a very simple example is, is the, the, you know, learning to tie a, 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 a knot in a suture with one hand when you're a surgeon, which is a kind of, a, a knack, really, but it's something that when you're trying to learn how to do it, you spend ages, I spent ages with bits of string around the back of a chair and things trying to, and, and then once I got that knack, I, I was able to do it, but when I then came on to try and teach other people, mm. I, I found I had to think in a different way about something that had become automatic, and breaking it down, it's not a simple process of, of disassembling things that you assembled, it doesn't, it's not a process that you can go equally easily along in both directions. And I think that the skill, I think that that's sort of wider, uh, there's a wider issue there around teaching and supporting people in their learning involves having an understanding of what they're going through to get there mm. and unpacking some of the processes that they need to go through that you can all too easily forget about if you rely only on your own experience. And you need to really, another one of these not about you, it's about them things, try and put yourself in that pers person's position to work out what is really their problem. In the same way we have to do clinically 
in with a patient in trying to work out what is their problem rather than rather than just sticking a diagnostic label on. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I suppose passing it on seems to be like a good point to end to, our end to, our to discussion. On, uh, Roger, um, big hand for Roger Debon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.